Good afternoon. We're going to cover three cases. The first one um, is a case that changed my life, and therefore it happened a long time ago. It doesn't have as much detail as the second two cases, but I think contextually it makes a, a very important understanding of the power of how to train somebody, change somebody in an exceptionally dangerous position using what you've been learning today. And I presented this at uh, the Institute for Functional Medicine back in uh, 2013 as part of a short presentation in which I use as a kind of a, a novella. As you know, I like to tie in books with different types of things. Dangerous Liaison is a book written by Pierre Chacalox de Laclos um, back in the 1800s. Have you seen the film? Essentially what happens is that he uses as characters people who are flawed. And so we see a lot of emotion, of trust uh, being broken, love, hate, and disruption. And effectively, it ends up with a pretty unpleasant ending. And so I decided that we would utilize this under a functional medicine model to call it mitochondrial DNA and dysbiosis activate the inflammasome and compress energy production or the adverse effects of sterile inflammation and the art of taming complexity. If I write a lot of title at the beginning, I can get most of my lecture over and done within the first second. So essentially, what I wanted to explain is that the case I'm going to present to you, the information that I've been teaching you today did not exist. So I am retrospectively attaching an event that occurred to me many years ago with more contemporized knowledge. To understand this more clearly, I put together a couple of pictures in which I'm going to make the explanation hopefully become clear. You inherit two things from your mother over which you have no control. One is the mitochondrial DNA, and the second is the dose of bacteria that you're given either during vaginal or cesarean transfer. We learnt over the last few days that mitochondria, when dysbiotic in nature, release soluble ATP and mitochondrial DNA, cardiolipid and oxidative stress, which are recognized as DAMs, damage associated molecular patterns, sometimes referred to as alarmins. These switch on this spider shape called the inflammasome and can induce systemic and local inflammation. At the same time, the bacteria that you have inside your gastrointestinal tract should produce motifs called MAMPs, which are molecular associated microbial patterns, which are friendly, but they often produce PAMPs, which are pathogen associated molecular patterns, which are unfriendly. So the DAMPs, alarmins, and PAMPs all tend to switch on the inflammasome, and a MAMP helps to inhibit it by blocking RNA being released from troublesome bacteria. And I explained to you that there were both pathogens and pathobionts and commensal organisms as a fluctuation between them. Now, those of you who trained a long, long, long time ago, like Mark, and those that you had trained only a long time ago, like some of you, and those of you obviously only just qualified because you look so young and fresh, <laughs> may have been taught a slightly erroneous concept in immunology, which is that there is a perception of self and non-self. I know it's still taught, despite the fact it's at least 20 years out of date, but essentially I'm going to use my thug and the police to try and explain why this is relevant so that you understand how alarmings work. The self-non-self -self model works on this basis. If these police officers and he went to the same primary school, the, despite the apparent difference in their personality and choice of clothing, they're going to let him walk by and survive. That's the self-non-self -self model. Molly, Polly Matzinger, an immunologist who was a former Playboy bunny and therefore always gets the biggest audiences at any immunology conference because most immunologists are sexually compressed and like to go and see anybody that had a little bit of flirt in the past. She says, he may have gone to the same school as them, but he's damaged. He's been breaking up local property and therefore he should be eliminated just as enthusiastically as if he wasn't known to those police officers. So our tissues can make ourselves become a target for our immune cell because we're damaged. You'll notice that the small spider tattoo that's appeared on his forehead identifies him for elimination. If any of you have a strange urge to put pen and ink on your body, never get a spider tattoo. 
If he was a pathogen, the same thing would happen. He'd still be recognized as being a problem, and the immune system would remove him. But if he had a MAMP, if he was possibly not familiar to them, but gave enough correct information to them, he'd be able to walk through. So poly Matzinger and subsequent changes mean that the self-non-self -self model, which is Burnett's model from 35 years ago, made immunology seem quite simple, just like the TH1, TH2 model made things seem quite simple, and now it's much more subtle. There are more difficult changes. I tell you that because the case we're going to get to will help you to understand why you need to understand those differences. So, in this specific situation, we have a variety of options available to us to change the relationship between damps or alarmins and PAMPs and the switching on of the inflammasome. We talked this morning about antioxidants. Quercetin in particular helps control inflammasome activation in the kidney. Phospholipids, I talked about repairing mitochondrial membranes. Glutathione as an antioxidant. Caloric restriction or time-restricted feeding or fasting. Curcumin is one example. And what about mammalian target of rapamycin? I didn't mention that today. How would we switch on mammalian target of rapamycin which sits within the mitochondria? Anybody familiar? We live in a wine growing region. Resveratrol. So resveratrol is a type of uh, food compound that switches on mTOR, and mTOR helps reduce damage to mitochondria. And on this side, we've got prebiotics, probiotics, vitamins A, D, and K, glutamine, apples, and cruciferous vegetables. As you now know, that's your armory for most mild to moderate dysbiotic events. The consequences of using these correctly helps to control adverse inflammatory activation. Now, George, the patient I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment, is an exceptionally complicated patient. And one of the reasons he has problems is because of uncontrollable epilepsy. Now, I didn't know this because this paper was only published in March, albeit there's been lead-up papers for this over the last few years. But it says here that anticonvulsants and anti-epileptic drugs, now called anti-seizure drugs, act on the underpinnings of nerve cell firing through ion channels that generate action potentials or neurotransmitter receptors. But there's considerable evidence that the inexcitable elements of the central nervous system are just as important. And it goes on to say that the classic view explains anti-seizure drug action as directly blocking ion channels in neurons. An alternative view, which pretty much fits everybody in this room, is that drugs block energy metabolism in both neurons and astrocytes can treat epilepsy. Well, metabolic interventions using dietary changes may achieve similar effects or mediate medication needs. And they do that by controlling lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. By reducing the amount of glycogen available to astrocytes, you can reduce the amount of potassium that's released, which in turn results in increased hyperpolarization and reduced numbers of seizures. All right, so I'm showing you this. Two things. We've got a complex understanding about how certain compounds, despite the fact that they're familiar, may by chance and damage become immunogenic, and that certain types of dietary approaches to individuals with epilepsy that change glucose availability may achieve similar effects to ion-based uh, drug therapy. The reason for that is because epilepsy, just like Alzheimer's, is now sometimes being referred to as a type 3 diabetes. So, I received a phone call at 6.30 on a Thursday afternoon at the end of a very long day in my practice. My secretary, I said, why are you putting this person through? And she said, you, you, you've got to speak to this woman. So I wanted to go home. I end up speaking to this lady who's crying her eyes out on the phone, desperate for me to take on the care of her child. Now, at the time I ran, a very big part of my practice was looking after children uh, diagnosed as being autistic. It's not unusual for me to get sobbing phone calls at different times of the day. However, over her tears, I could hear a screaming sound like a trapped animal and a banging. And I asked her what it was, and it was her son screaming and headbanging the table and had been doing so for a number of hours. This little chap, she said to me, she has seven days before they're going to take her child away, place him in care. We had seven days to intervene, and it's a sort of case where every one of you would have the same thought as me. Who the hell can I refer this person to at 6.30 on a Thursday night? 
By seven o'clock, she convinced me that I should try and do something because she was running out of options. So I've summarized for you some of the history so you can get a sense of the complexity of this case and what we were going to do. Up until the age of nine months, he'd been deemed as a normal child before he had his first seizure. I'll tell you now that there was no index event that seemed to precipitate this beginning. He'd been verbal in that he'd be able to say mama and dada, and he'd vomited, but only once or twice. By the time that he was one year old, he was vomiting six to eight times per hour. He was referred to Great Ormond Street, and he was given anti-epileptic medication. But he still developed myoclonic seizures. Typically, he was getting up to 20 at a time, and 500 or so of these per month at the time that I spoke to her. He was also having 70 tonic seizures per month and one to two tonic clonic seizures per day. He was no longer vocalizing words. He was screaming continuously. And he was still vomiting six to eight times per hour, irrespective of whether he had consumed any food. And bile acids are very abrasive to oropharyngeal tissues and cause blistering and pain. He was hyperactive and self-abusive. Those of you who've managed children on the autistic spectrum will know some will follow self-abusive rituals where they press the abdomen to relieve pain against hard surfaces, and occasionally you'll meet one little head bang for one or two moments per day. George would do this for hours, which is why they put him in a helmet. The medication he was on was Epilim, Tegretol, Topamax, and Clonazepam. The doses that this child was receiving at two and a half years of age was equivalent to a full-grown adult, and it was clearly having little or no effect on his seizure patterns. The diagnosis he had received was that he was autistic with uncontrolled epilepsy, severe learning difficulties, and extreme management problems, such that Great Ormond Street had initiated a claim to extract the child from the family. In part, this is because the marriage was failing rapidly in the face of extreme difficulty in looking after a child who had no day for the previous year in which he did not display excessively unpleasant behavior patterns. So, yesterday I said to you, there are two simple questions to keep in your mind when you meet somebody. Despite the fact you've been overwhelmed, it's now 7.15 on the Thursday night, you've got to do something. So the two questions I say is, what could you add and what could you take away? So I throw the question out. What would you suggest to this mother as a takeaway suggestion? A milk and gluten-free diet. Yes. You go 10 out of 10. So in autistic studies conducted over many years, started by Carl Reichelt, is that certain urinary components are found in, the, uh, in, found in children with autism that are associated with dairy and gluten consumption. Taking away dairy and taking away gluten is only really relevant if the person's eating it. So my question is, what do you feed your child? Weetabix and milk makes the majority of that child's diet because they can take almost no solid foods. He's sick within minutes of whatever he eats. Weight management is almost impossible. He's been given liquid food from the hospital to try and maintain his weight as well. But clearly, he's getting two highly provocative foods three or four times a day. So I say, you have got to stop giving him milk and you've got to stop giving him Weetabix. We're going to get you to order some goat's milk, so you can swap it around because GOS will take them away even faster if they discover that you've now removed the food that they have recommended he consume for the diet from the dietitian. Wouldn't it be more appropriate to put the kid on a bone bro broth, which is now one uh, the aspect, something coming into vogue. Uh, chicken broth, 
uh, with vegetables, something very bland, and the only grain allowed would be rice because we have to look at gluten, lectins, and saponins as well because they also pro promote leaky gut. They can also cause inflammation of the brain. Zonulin is deadly. You know what I mean. I do know uh, where you're going. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're uh, familiar with the GAPS diet or the GAPS principle. I'm familiar with my diet, which is gluten grain-free and total paleo, virtually the healthiest diet in the world. Okay, and let me interrupt you. And you have seven case, days. You have seven days before this child's removed from your home. You have a mother who's incoherent with anxiety. You do not see her. She's on the telephone. You have seven days to intervene. Everything you're suggesting is perfectly reasonable. I'm giving you a seven-day window. I am not going to try and persuade a mother who's incoherent that she's got to go out and buy bones and start preparing a broth from the first conversation that I had. So this is the first chicken, conversation. Chicken soup. Chicken soup and just We're on the first conversation, rice. sir. I'm going to interrupt you because everything you're saying is correct, but it's my lectern, not yours. Sorry. The next thing we talk about is... The question I said, we're going to remove gluten and we're going to remove casein. This is August 2003. And I'm going to recommend, what do I give this person? It's Saccharomyces boulardii, L-carnitine, digestive enzymes, and cod liver oil. Why did I recommend cod liver oil? Vitamin A and D, and it's liquid. One dose per day, Mary Megson demonstrated in a study published 18 years ago that in children with autism, lateral viewing of the eye could be reversed in most cases within two weeks by giving cis retinol because the G-alpha receptor proteins in the retro-orbital space of the eye are desperate for vitamin A, and they're poorly absorbed in children who have autism because they eat appallingly, a diet that's always nutritionally deficient. But it also is exceptionally important for mitochondrial functionality and also helps multiple, auto, multiple immune tissues in the gastrointestinal tract. Why would I recommend L-carnitine? Fatty acid utilization, correct. We've got to transport fats of any type that we can get at this stage that are not going to be immunogenic for them into the cell so we can get peroxisome utilization of those fats for energy. And Saccharomyces boulardii, we're going to give him that because at the time I had been treating over 300 children and we'd run tests on about 220 for a paper we published demonstrating that at the first presentation the vast majority are absent or insufficient levels of secretory IgA. And I've alluded to that today. It's important for mucosal tolerance and induction of microbial composition. But we give very tiny doses to children. We're giving a cocktail stick dampened dunked into the capsule that's been opened and placing the contents onto the tongue or into the tissues around the mouth two or three times per day. And we're going to use digestive enzymes to facilitate a breakdown of whatever they're eating at that particular time. So that's day one. 7.30 at night, I'm desperate to go home. These are my recommendations. Within three days, all reflux had stopped. That's simply by exclusion, because the products didn't arrive until the second day. Regular diarrhea had stopped. So simply by taking away two provocative foods, the body's need to eliminate them had gone. For over 18 months, the dietitians at the hospital had insisted that Weetabix and cow's milk was to be the constituent food for this child, despite the fact of the symptomology. Six weeks in, the tonic-clonic seizures had dropped from six to seven per week to one. Myoclonic had dropped from 500 to none. Clonic had dropped from one to two per month. And during that time, those six weeks, it also had a fever. Up until then, any fever required immediate admission. But it went through this fever phase without any inappropriate induction of seizures or panics, demonstrating his body is now able to handle a normal elimination of a pathogen. By the end of 2004, when he was just about four years of age, and I'm jumping a long way ahead, this required an awful lot of letter writing, court preparations. We went through an enormous amount of political, legal, and immunological interventions with this child. I should have referred her the first night. It committed me to the last 20 years of research into this subject because nobody had any answer and we were given week after week, if it doesn't get better, he's going into care. Eventually, I persuaded the neurologist at 
Great Ormond Street, that he and I were never, ever going to get on. That he should refer us to a female neurologist who was far more plastic in her interpretation, and we reduced that medication by 75% at the age of four. By which time he could attend school, he was now verbal, all of his diagnostic titles had been removed, the marriage was now back together again, and whilst he had to remain constantly vigilant in terms of the food selections and remain on those supplements, he was able to be able responsive. Very early on, she'd written to me to say that finally he'd sat up in his chair and had a smile of recognition on his face and started to wrap back and forth to a children's program. This is the first clue that he was emerging from this hideous soup of disorientation from after which he began to improve, such as the point at four years of age. She sent this photograph to show that this is a nice, healthy young boy who's gone on, this is a long time ago now, he's gone through normal school, he's in upper schools now. And the only immune measurement we took was secretory IgA, which at the beginning, because we could collect it from his drool, we collect it by using a spoon to pick up the drool, soak a small uh, cotton wool uh, collection uh, pad into it, send it off to the lab to get it spinned out, but in three months, four months, we went from 37.9 to 91.3. And generally speaking, I always find if you get it up around 100 with children, you get much more stable immune responses. So I'm setting the scene with a little bit of a narrative. Obviously, I've told you far more detail in today's lectures than I knew back then. Functional medicine allows you sometimes to dive into an unknown environment because you're using good sense around your knowledge. This little chap's life got changed by working out that he was being given something he shouldn't be and was missing something he should have. And then over that time, including changes to total food selection, migrated through to increase a greater and greater diversity of food so that he could include more and more nutrients. And as you can see, that's a pretty healthy looking four-year-old and he's not wearing a helmet. So on to the next one now that you're all feeling emotionally connected to me. <laughs> Who isn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, go and visit your friend in agony. So we're going to talk about a 46-year-old Caucasian. This is another, another case. Um, yesterday I gave fairly predictable cases. These are obviously less predictable. It's to give you a sense of where understanding how you can utilize the gut can give you roots into different types of, of problems you might see. This is a referral from a colleague in South Africa. And uh, he's a 46-year-old man. He's had ongoing uh, stomach problems since a trip to Malawi in 1992. So he is a very bright individual and uh, far brighter than his physician in terms of immune relationships. And so ultimately, uh, he wanted someone to come and try and knock him back into shape. In 2009, I've really compressed this down, but in 2009, he had severe cellulitis of his leg after which he developed severe nausea, visceral sensitivity, and weight loss. So we have a two th 1992 and 2009. After that, he was treated for six months with diet, probiotics, and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. He had a relapse in May of 2010 and was given the same protocol for six months. So at this stage, you're thinking, well, that doesn't seem too bad. What causes problems after being treated for an infection? Antibiotics. So what are the common results of antibiotic therapy on the mucosal complexity? We lose diversity, likelihood of gene transfer, change in compositional ratios. A number of things can occur. Sometimes they recover spontaneously, sometimes they don't. So this is in May 2010. Then in June 2013, he began to get severe nausea and vomiting, pallor, and a sense of malaise, and he had an investigation from the same clinician that had nursed in post-treatment with cellulitis with a stool test, which showed very raised secretory IgA, which has remained high over the last 18 months. Now, I have measured thousands of people's secretory IgA, and it's only ever one other patient that I've seen with these levels. So these are unusual for me, and I'm sure they'd probably be unusual for you too. He'd lost 14 kilograms of weight over the last six-month period, and the blood test done, which he was paying for to get done regularly, uh, South Africa doesn't have a, a public health service that you want to make use of, so he's making uh, regular tests. 
He showed leukocytosis and neutrophilia, as well as the elevated neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which he very kindly put into a chart, the Centony, showing all the different ratios that he'd had. Now, his secretory IgA results, I thought you'd quite like to see these in a bit more detail. He's got scores as high as 7,500, 7,400, and his low levels are 2,428, and we're really looking for scores of between 150 and 200. So here's a massive outpouring of a soluble protein into the mucosal tissue. So here's my question for you. Why would somebody be producing that much immunoglobulin A? What is their body attempting to do? Fight infection, that one? Getting rid of something, yes? Is it a food sensitivity? Uh, possibility, but I've never seen someone with food reactivity with scores like that. Get rid of a nasty bug, those nasty, nasty bugs. So essentially, we're all agreed, I think, that secretory IgA is predominantly seen as an exclusionary protein. It has an anti-inflammatory component. It has secondary benefits improving compositional mix of bacteria. And we'd expect it to increase in the face of a challenge. And that challenge may be parasitic, may be viral, or it may be bacterial. And at that sort of level, it should be surfing its way out of its colon. <laughs> it's also known as the happy antibody or the mood antibody because stress, anxiety, and frustration will suppress it. I say this guy was stressed, had anxiety, and was very frustrated by the time I spoke to him. So despite the emotional suppression of secretory IgA, it's still chucking it out. So he's trying to do something. Well, in addition, he measured his calprotectin levels, which were raised. And as you know, it's a neutrophil-derived protein consistent with patients who have IBD. However, he's been scoped, he's been tested, he does not, to all criteria, have an inflammatory bowel disease, but he's pumping out an inflammatory protein. What does that continue to suggest to you? What's the word beginning with D that we've so enjoyed hearing me say today? Dysbiosis. Correct. Something has disturbed that relationship similarly to that you might experience with someone with inflammatory bowel disease, which is a condition in which the relationship between the normal commensal bacteria and the immune system has become dysfunctional without the presence of the pathology. He had a CT scan done in June, and it showed mesenteric lymphedema, retropetroneal lymph nodes were swollen, particularly on the paraortic and aortocaval sites. Suggestive of an infection. Why do lymph tissues swell in the site of infection? Because they're collecting material. Their body is attempting to eliminate it. And they're going to be collecting material bands of antibodies. He's producing a lot of antibodies. There's a possibility that they're swollen in part because these antibodies are agglutinating to something albeit no one knows what it is at this stage, and it's been pulled into the lymph tissue to be washed away. So we have a physical indication of an infection. We have a symptom indication of an infection. We have protein-related outputs consistent with an infection, but we have no diagnostic definition of an infection. So I said to him, perhaps you do a stool test for me. How many of you ask your patients to do stool tests? Oh, much better than my last group. You're a much better poo party. <laughs> so in this one up here, we can see these I like to see as commensals, patho, uh, bionts, you know, these are your husbands, and then pathogens. If we think about that sort of bit. We can look to see these scores. They should be three plus or four. Nothing really stands out except the scary E. coli is a bit low. We've got Klebs yellow pneumoniae. Um, subspecies pneumonia, we're not going to say you want it, but at scores of one plus, we'd be hard pushed to say that that's our triggering agent. And on this side, no dysbiotic flora. But we've already convinced ourselves he's dysbiotic. So we're feeling a bit let down. Candida uh, species down here in the mycology profile, a little bit 
nothing really much to worry about. You'd expect to see somebody with significant alterations in gastrointestinal tract that might show a bit of mycology changes. A one plus isn't going to flag it for me. And then down here, in terms of microscopy, uh, he's normal in terms of just moderate levels of uh, presence of yeast. Now, somebody who's immunosuppressed will often generate large quantities of uh, candida inside the gastrointestinal tract. What is candida's primary killer in the gastrointestinal tract? It's an enzyme, and it's produced by secretory IgA. So anti-candida, anti-secretory IgA, protease enzymes degrades them so that they cannot proliferate. So we'd be pretty surprised to find large quantities with the amount of secretory IgA he's producing. We also looked at things including presence of ova or parasites. Reasonable? None there. Both samples were negative. Giardia and cryptosporidium were also missing. So we're running out of nice, easy solutions. We can see on this one here that he's got normal markers for digestive enzyme functionality, but lysozyme, another protein for inflammation, scoring 963, should be below 600. Once again, we have a protein indication that something is going wrong, but it doesn't appear to be very easy. I'm not the first person he has consulted with. I'm like the 12th. The usual thing that people are going through trying to find help. And in the stool test, he's got secretory IgA at 1,100. Another consistent indicator, he's got too high a level. Do you see the difference between salivary collection and stool collection? One of the reasons is that in the stool, secretory IgA degrades in the colon. So the best way to tell circulating secretory IgA is by salivary collection. Specific IgA in the stool is useful, but most of the work on stool collections is based on the fact that when you do mouse models, they're very difficult to get mice to spit into a tube. But it's very easy to make them poo. So the next piece of this information, what we look down here, We've got um, all the short-chain fatty acids, those metabolites that induce regulatory T cells, appear to be okay. We might have expected to see low levels of propionate or butyrate. They're not brilliant, but they're not worrying. And then red blood cells okay, pH is a bit suppressed. Why might we see a low pH in the stool? You can just chuck it out, don't feel nervous. No one will laugh, Mark won't hear you. Short-chain fatties look okay, don't they? You'd expect it to be overly productive in short-chain fatty acids. I'll save the time, bile acids. One of the things that can sometimes cause this is that recirculating of bile acids is less efficient in a dysbiotic gut, and sometimes they'll migrate into the colon and lower the pH of the stool. And then the color of the stool was brown, and it's loose and watery. What does that say to us from this morning's talk, or yesterday's talk, what makes stools loose and watery in IBS patients? It begins with the letters I and L and has a number at the end of it. Randomly select a number. Six. Who said six? Very, very good. IL-6 is induced in the face of infection and dysbiosis, drags water into the lumen as part of exclusion. So here's another secondary indicator that this person has an infection. So he then wrote to me and said, look, December through January, I had relapsed really badly with regards to my health. I had severe stomach pain, nausea, and malaise. I opted to have my secretory IgA and cow protective measured to see if there be any correlation. See, he's not an interesting normal patient, is he? Between feeling worse and these two markers. His cow protectin was negative, which is as good as he can get, but his IgA was 7,500. So could we reasonably say that he's actually exceptionally good at producing plasma cells that in turn is really good at chucking out secretory component and IgA, which is suppressing some of the proteins normally associated with infection. We could. That sort of level is very, very unusual. He's maintained that for two years. That's pretty impressive. So we said, well, what about an organic acid test? Let's just, before we do anything else, I've done nothing so far. I'm just listening, collecting data. He did an organic acid test. Now, we can see, do, how many of you do organic acid tests? Just a few of you. They're sometimes useful. Oxalic acid here indicates nothing other than it's likely to be dysbiosis for me. A succinic acid is a secondary marker of mitochondrial dysfunction. 
recommended here, CoQ10 and riboflavin. So succinic acid in organic profiles gives you an indication that you have less efficient ATP production or some form of mitochondrial dysfunction. And then down here, we've got quinolinate and kynurinate acid ratios are changing. Uh, Dr. Haase told you about these two secondary metabolites from tryptophan degradation. And the enzyme that breaks them down is endolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, which is induced in gastrointestinal tissue in the face of an infection. So once again, this suggests to me that dysbiosis, regardless of the absence of presence of dysbiotic bacterium at stool test, something is happening. What is the second most abundant organism in our gut that may be indicated that we cannot identify on a culture test? It begins with V. Viruses. I'm beginning to think, could this be a viral problem? somewhat embedded with inside the gastrointestinal tissue. I know you were as well. Down here, we've got a problem in that we've got glutathione requirements. The glutathione precursors, or N-acetylcysteine, is a conditionally essential amino acid, which is also known to inhibit NF-kappa-B. So I'm thinking maybe there's some use in this, plus it's antiviral. That may be a possibility for us to consider. And then it depends on the indication for need. It wasn't great, but uh, it might be useful. And then lastly, he got raised levels of uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine substrates, indicating that he might be under stress. I think we probably agree he's already feeling a bit stressed out. So one of the things to keep in mind is, is there a core microbiome? Because I'm going to say, this is not a viral problem. This is not a parasitic problem. This is a bacterial problem. A core microbiome has at least 1,300 species of 8,000 different strains or more, and they're divided into principal groups, Firmicutes, Bacteroides, Proteobacteria, and Actinobacteria. Look at the ratios. So I thought to myself, okay, what can I do? I could treat it if it's an active and current infection. I could treat it if it was a post-infectious event, but is now immunologically sensitized. I could treat it as if the consequences of the above are that dysbiosis exists regardless of the presence on the stool test with inadequate T cell generation and poor management of immune tolerance. So we didn't try and induce those naive T cells to become friendly adolescents as a regulatory phenotype. I could treat him with immune enhancement as a primary goal and modify at the same time as many commensal factors as possible to achieve it. I might be able to use a direct intervention to manipulate cytokine expression and enhance the health. These are all non-drug-based therapies. I'm not looking at antibody inhibition or monoclonal therapy. I could explore additional pathology risks, i.e., I could do more tests. What else might be going on? I could, if I wanted to, impressively link this to a virome problem, but there's no way I'd be able to demonstrate efficacy or outcome based on that strategy, proving that that was the cause, because I couldn't easily identify viruses in the gut. There isn't a way of doing that for us. I came up with a proposal, and my proposal was this. Take oregano in a time-release format so that it migrates primarily to the distal portion of the small intestine and to the colon. 150 milligrams per day. He'd been on oregano before, but not this particular type. It targets gram-negative bacteria, and I want him to do it for 6 to 12 weeks. I recommended artemisinin and annua as a form of artemisinin, in which we know there's a 30 to 1 ratio of the active ingredients. Artemisinin is a highly oxidative uh, nutrient that kills a lot of different pathogens. It's quite non-specific, unless you've got a malarial problem, which is very specific for malaria. It has antiviral and antibacterial components to it. It also treats certain types of parasites. This is my broad spectrum antimicrobial. Okay, I'm fishing to see whether we can do something. However, with artemisia, you must measure liver enzymes, particularly if you're going to give them a reasonable dose because ALTs and GSTs will rise in the face of certain, some people who take artemisia, and then you'll get a drug-induced liver inflammation, which you do not want. Saccharomyces boulardii, which you by now begin to get a feel. I do like this organism. Normally, we use this to raise secretory IgA. This guy has got a boat moored in his gut on his secretory IgA. Why would I give him additional stuff? Well, because secretory IgA also suppresses another interleukin, interleukin-8, which is frequently raised in the face of gut infection and also cause ingress of water into the colon. Not as much as interleukin-6, but enough. And basically, it's a friend for me. 
I figured I'd have a go and see how we got on. I gave him MitoQ, which is a type of ubiquinine. I showed you a study this morning for reducing pain in colitis models of mice. Uh, and mitochondria cross over multiple areas, and we saw succinic acid had been raised. So I thought I'd try with that. And I gave him a probiotic. I mentioned to you this morning a particular probiotic called Friendericii propionibacterium, which I understand is available to you as part of a complex of organisms from bioceuticals. Uh, I didn't know that, and I'm not getting paid for saying so. But you can utilize that organism because, as you learned this morning, it has a very specific effect on our hydrocarbon induction of anti-inflammatory activity in IBD patients. So that's a strain-specific probiotic to treat an IBD presentation without the presence of histology that suggests he's got IBD, but with lots of markers typical of it. I gave him vitamin A because we learned vitamin A is exceptionally important for all types of small intestinal immune responses. My cruciferous vegetable story, of course, as you know by now, and of course the retire early and buy yourself a holiday home recipe, apples, in which I included recommendations how to put them together for a restructuring of colonic bacteria. And I thought maybe I give him some humic acid. What would we use humic acid for? Not familiar with that in Australia? Yes, humic acid binds the viruses as they leave tissue. It helps reduce replication of viruses. So I flagged that, maybe we'll look at that. Okay, we were having a conversation, what else can we do? And the University College of Cape Town, UCT, uh, is now starting to do microbiome research and we're looking for volunteers. So uh, he phoned up and said, would they do a PCR of his gut bacteria? This is a genetic analysis of the gut bacteria rather than us doing a culture. It came back showing that his actinobacteria composed 80% of his stool, whereas it should only be 1% to 6%. His firmicutes were at 19%, should be 55 to 60 and his bacteroides were 0.4 and should be 12%. This is a dramatic shift in compositional diversity and relationships. This is dysbiosis of an exceptional quality. But it's the normal commensal organisms that don't flag as being pathogenic. But they're way out of whack. But this is a kicker. He found that within the actinobacteria section, a specimen called Arthrobacter paskins existed. How many of you have heard of Arthrobacter paskins? None of you. You have, sir. Sorry? It doesn't cause arthritis, but it's found in soil. It shouldn't be in you. Although there's one paper published on an IBD patient who had Arthrobacter, but not of the Paskins variety. We have a patient with indications of IBD, but no signs of it. But this works out that in theory, he has a massive overgrowth of Arthrobacter Paskins 40% of his total microbiome is a soil-based organism. What happened in 1992? Went to Malawi. Obviously, they eat a lot of soil in Malawi. <laughs> He's now a two-legged clump of sod, as far as this bacteria is concerned. This, we suspect, is our pathogen. You cannot culture it in a typical stool test because nobody is going to be looking for it. So I've now treated this guy prior to getting this information together, utilizing the information we've used today. Only risk was the artemisinin. Everything else is safe, consistent. You can use it for years. What's happened? This is just me showing where the actinobacteria can appear in a colonic tissue. He says that in April, just before I came here, he's had a second PCR test because nobody at the UCT believed the first one. Had a second one done. Similar levels come back. So repetition demonstrates that it's there. We've now got an infectious disease specialist crawling all over him. He's so excited about this. He really appreciates all that we've done. He's better for what he's been doing. His neutrophils are down to 7. White cells are down to 7. And neutrophils are down to 4.5. So we're demonstrating his body, for the first time in months, is starting to produce less white blood cells to defeat an infection based on that simple intervention that I gave him with an unknown pathogen 
but with an understanding of some perception of dysbiosis. Energy is up, really bad days are fewer. I'd very much like to send you a measure of my appreciation. I said, brown paper bag, large wads of cash, uh, whenever, whenever you're ready. So we're going to follow this guy. We're going to track him now. At UCT are involved. We can get PCRs done regularly. We'll see what, how long he continues with this program and track whether we can get rid of that soil-based organism out of his body. Yes, sir. That was schistosomiasis you've just treated with Artemisus, and it would fit the same pattern, wouldn't it? The mass of IgA, Malawi is one of the best-known places for getting schistosomiasis. Did someone make sure he didn't have that? Yes, he's been screened, not by me, by multiple gastroenterologists. Don't overestimate what people scream for. Correct. Don't underestimate the ability to find something. That's true. But nothing has been found. And you're absolutely right. Tropical medicine specialists in Africa are very familiar with their parasitic burden. He worked his way through from Johannesburg up to Nairobi and back down again. They haven't been able to find anything. So I went on the data that I'll trust that data to date. That's the first one that anyone's found. Seems to be working. Same treatment. Same treatment, exactly. And this is a key thing, and Mohawk's really flagged it up there, and I think you'll see this in our summary stuff tomorrow. If you know that there are multiple points of intervention of commonly shared receptors, you only have to change subtly the difference between our epileptic intervention to begin with and then the infectious intervention here. There are still commonalities each way through. And in my third case history, which I'll whip through when we do some questions. Ten minutes. Okay, oh, oh, I have plenty of time for questions. This is quite funny, and at the same time, very different. So we've done central nervous system problems. Now we've done unknown infection. Now we're going to do typical 42-year-old disaster. One of my good friends has been training in functional medicine for the last two years. He's a GP. He loves it. He's really enthusiastic, uh, and went for a program uh, submission to BBC out of 400 doctors. He got selected on Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday he got selected, to be their new face of a new approach to medicine for a program called Doctor in the House. So he got through 400 people, got rejected. He got selected with his proposal to do a functional medicine treatment for somebody. So they hired him on Wednesday. He phoned me Wednesday night and said, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> I'm going to get the patient tomorrow. Will you help? Sure. So patient D is seen the next morning. And then we get the blood test on Friday. They start filming on Saturday. They give us 28 days before the end of the program to demonstrate a change using non-drug-based therapy to correct this individual. Okay? So his wife had written into the BBC because she was worried about her husband. He had a poor lipid profile, strong family history of early heart disease, smoked 40 a day had psoriasis, he was taking daily antihistamines for allergies with regular skin itching, he was bloated, he had constipation, he had indigestion, he's taking ranitidine daily, he's taking SSRIs, he had back pain, he was snoring, he had sleep apnea, and all of that had to be sorted out in 28 days. The only test results we were given were these, which I'll come to in a second, but he used to be a young fit man and Harvard fantasies about becoming a football coach. He was pretty immobile and was a chain smoker, but it wasn't very easy. He didn't really like doing anything except a bit of walking. But uh, my colleague says, when he met me, he seemed pretty motivated, especially with the family support to sort his health out. On taking his history, he felt that he was showing reactions to milk or ice cream and possibly gluten or wheat, so maybe an enzyme deficiency, maybe non-gluten, uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and we suspected a dysbiosis. So we're given this information on Friday. We have to write up a plan, what we're going to do, because we're going to start it on Saturday. You know this, it's a typical pressure. You get it every week, every day when you see somebody. And he has no money. <laughs> okay, so we have to do something for free, and it has to happen quickly. At the end of it, we're going to be filmed, during that program, we're going to be interviewed to say why we're doing what we're doing. And if it goes wrong, it's going to be a fantastic disaster on TV. And if it goes right, it might be a big success. So blood test came back. Total cholesterol was 6.7, tri triglycerides 4.2, HDL 0.9. I've highlighted the ones in red that were wrong. LDL 3.9, HbA1c was 5.7. Waste to hip ratio was 1, above 95 is high. 
Triglycerides to HDL ratio is 4.66. Ideally, we want that to be below 2. Blood pressure is 130 over 90. Uh, no previous diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, but we're going, this guy is a metabolic disaster. What would you do? And you can't refer. <laughs> apples. I like you saying apples, and certainly it always makes me feel good, but randomly selecting a fruit at this stage <laughs> is, is not clinical care. What else would we do? Increase fiber. Increase fiber. And what are we not going to say to increase? <laughs> exactly. The devil's spawn. <laughs> Particularly because we suspect he's an in non celiac gluten sensitive person. What type of supplements? Bearing in mind, I'm going to give him the supplements because there's no way we're running this roller coaster of a ride without some extra help. I'm going to give him some supplements. What do you think we should give him? Yeah, of course. Saccharomyces boulardii. It's easy. We give them a few things, and I'll show you them in just a second. But these are our recommendations, okay? No gluten, no dairy, no processed food at all. That's basically Darren thinks he's looking at an empty plate at this point. <laughs> is to have no starchy carbs like potatoes, especially chips, which is his favorite nighttime snack. No vegetable oil. He's got to try and increase vegetable consumption, particularly focus on the colors of the rainbow. This works quite well. Do you know what colors of the rainbow are, Darren? Yes. Can you identify vegetables that fit that color frame? Yes. Let's go to the local store and film you choosing one. That's what a vegetable looks like, yes. <laughs> Here's the selection. Now, we showed him a carrot, or I didn't show him. He was shown a carrot by my colleague. And then he was shown 12 bags of carrots <laughs> whilst he's being filmed. And he says, that's how many carrots you've got to eat in order to get adequate quantities of retinoic acid in your body, or well, vitamin A, as we would say, to make a change to the gut, mucosal, immune response. Or what would you eat with them? And then you only have to eat one bag. So, of course, TV love that sort of thing, don't they? So, avocado, one bag of carrot, no avocado, 12 bags of carrot. We're going to increase good fats of a diet, olive oil, olives, avocados, nuts, etc. All completely new to D. Supplementation, lactobacillus GD, one a day, saccharomyces, two per day, vitamin D3 complete. That includes vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Tocotrienols is a type of vitamin E extracted from uh, red palm oil demonstrated in multiple studies to lower cholesterol. This is my safety box. I can get them down 20%, I figure, in 28 days combined with tocotrienols. And we use a ratio of 6 to 1 of omega-6 to omega-3 of carefully selected oils as a salad dressing because these are quite good at producing an anti-inflammatory response. I know everyone's been indoctrinated with omega-6 oils are almost as bad as wheat, but correctly selected for the right person, they're very anti-inflammatory. More activity, only really achieved in the third week, discuss relaxation through breathing techniques. Two weeks in, diet and supplementation alone is having a major impact. His bloating's gone, constipation's gone, indigestion's gone, waist circumference down one centimeter. He has more energy, less fatigue, Snoring almost disappeared. The BBC paid 800 pounds to book a sleep apnea clinic 14 days after we started. When they got there, he didn't have any. Two weeks in, his sleep apnea is gone. He had an aha moment when he was out for his nan's birthday, discovered eating sausages that contained gluten made him feel worse. Because at that point, he's just thinking that this is all basically you know, woo-woo. Now he recognizes it's poo-poo. <laughs> Four weeks on, different person. Total cholesterol down. 5.2 or 5.1, a 24% reduction. Triglycerides down to 2, a 52% reduction. LDL down 15%. HDL was static at 0.9. We could have given him some niacin, but we were trying to demonstrate a relatively modest cost was necessary in order to translate this across more public health care. Weight, uh, weight ratio had improved. His total weight had gone down. His BP down to 120 over 70. His skin had much improved. He was a much nicer person. And part of what we were doing is trying to show that caloric restriction away from higher fat, high sugary foods allows the gut to repair itself. He was now empowered. He said he got control over his health for the first time ever in his life. He only taking antihistamines every few days. He's not taking ranitidine anymore. He started to forget taking his antidepressant medication. He was smoking less by default. We did not ask him to give up. We figured that the first list we gave him would be terrifying enough. 
say no smoking as well, but look at this blood oxygenation, down from 50 to 15. He doesn't want to smoke so much, and partly what he would do is snack during the day and smoke at the same time. One of the other groups said, why didn't you recommend intermittent fasting? I said, as far as he was concerned, we had. We said three meals a day with nothing in between. So, there we go. Uh, won't worry about those. We'll get to the end. I hope you found those interesting. I'll take a question or two. Regarding your magic apple recipe, oh, yes. does the stewing change the uh, constituents much at all? Yes. In what way? Oh, your, uh, second question. <laughs> yeah, you release pectin and you release raffinose by stewing it. It's much harder. If you've already got a dysbiotic gut, you're not going to be able to release those. Even if you munch down on two raw apples a day, it's very much tougher to get those out. So we effectively mimic the consequences of metabolic degradation by cooking it. And we cook that with a bit of water, add in the cinnamon, and I always put a few little raisins in there when we start off because people go, oh, all of those apples are going to be bitter. Put a few raisins in, it means they won't add sugars. Although large arabinogalactans is a sweetener, but it's also an immunomodulator. So I don't know if you get um, large arabinogalactans over here, but you can add that in so that they get past that resistance stage and they're still getting some immune benefit from it. Um, I'm just interested. I mean, this was a, you know, a national program. Yes. And you're advocating no, no dairy, no wheat for this gentleman. What was the commentary from those industries and food manufacturing? There's been no comment. There's no comment. This is a pilot study. Originally, the plan was to have six different GPs go into a house, hence doctor in the house, and take on a typical complex patient group. This was so successful, the head of science at BBC called up my colleague, who's a GP, and he thought he was going to be sacked, to say that they, one, never anticipated us having any outcome at all, and two, they'd never seen anything this successful in such a short period of time. Would he do another six programs? They only want him to do it, which means I've got to do another six programs. <laughs> so, es yeah, so essentially, they're paying him. Yeah, I don't get paid. So essentially what they're doing is that they're now thinking, well, maybe there's something to this. Because everything thinks about lifestyle medicine is long term and it's boring and what have you. But using specific nutrient compounds together with pretty straightforward, sensible advice does result in quite significant markers. My colleague's still practicing as a GP and is obviously aware that if he gets this wrong, he's going to get roasted. So we want to make sure every time that we get this as right as we can so that he can continue working in the profession and we can make functional medicine seem to be a realistic transfer from one-to-one -one care to more generalized care. Over here. Hey, hi. Just a, um, a question. Your fellow with the, the terrible gut stuff from South Africa, um, in one of his tests he had quite low E. coli comparatively and... Um, there's a company here that I do a lot of testing with and quite often we get low E. coli and a high streptococcus or enterococcus. I was just wondering if you've got any comments about your management in that setting. There are various different types of E. coli, of course, and some of which are pathogenic and some are, some are not. These are the non-pathogenic versions, otherwise they'd be flagged on the right-hand side. To me, it just looks like a deficiency dysbiosis of that species. If we look at the end results, what we know... 40% of his gut is a soil-based organism. Perhaps that has a natural competitive inhibition of E. coli. I've no idea. There's no data on it. But one might extrapolate that notion. Uh, but generally speaking, if you add in that fibrous compounds that we're discussing, you'll always see a change in those bacterial ratios. Just as an aside, I used to do a lot of organic acid tests, uh, particularly with children on the autistic spectrum, because collecting blood from children is always difficult. Collecting blood from autistic children requires a team. Um, and so we used to do organic acid profiling right at the very beginning, and then i test them again six weeks later. And I began to realize that the gut stuff we're doing with these kids, that basic program, because if you've ever seen an organic acid profile of an autistic individual, there's red right the way across all four pages. Everything is disturbed. When you treat their gut, probably 90% of that goes away. So it gave me an increasing confidence that many of the organic compounds that we're pouring out of people who become very disturbed just need the gastrointestinal tract to become a better interpreter of their environment, which is what we're trying to do with these interventions. Um, 
apples very briefly. Could we blend them? So Would you get the same effect if you blend the, blended the Blend apples? No, I think that it's a, it's a bit like uh, our American colleagues insist on calling stewed apples apple sauce. Uh, and they say, but my patient wants to buy it in a jar from a shop. Part of the restoration of someone's health is giving them a chance to take control. And I think that getting someone to cook something and invest time in it as a therapeutic tool has as much impact at this early stage of their treatment as the benefits from that food. If you blend it, I think you rip apart it too much. There must still be little bits of firm apple in there in order that you have both small intestine and large intestine benefits from the pectin and from the raffinose. You could, if you've got nothing and you're sick to death of, blend, of cooking it on your stove, but I've used it for 20 years. I've always found that cooking it in a saucepan, leaving small chunks with bits of skin on the outside, only about 10% of the apple's worth of skin, works best. I have to, I'm sorry, leave it there. We've only got 10 minutes to swap rooms and get this gentleman elsewhere. Who thinks he's showing off? Case studies that difficult that you solve. I mean, I have never solved one like <laughs> any of those. I've been around a long time. I was told to bring Now I just feel stories. stupid. <laughs> I want you to put your hands together. Thank you very much. Mm.